good afternoon. I am back. Uh, we will, now we will start a new lecture about uh, ocean energy. It's a different uh, matter than uh, the last uh, lecture. Uh, and the professor Paulo Rosa dos Santos from the University of Porto that uh, have uh, uh, a lot of experience about that matter will do the lecture. I, I, I will read some uh, uh, curriculum about Professor Paulo. Uh, professor Paulo Rosa dos Santos is a professor of uh, at the Faculty of Engineering of the uh, University of Porto, Portugal, an uh, integrated member of CIMAR, that is, that is a interdisciplinary center of mari marine and environment research at the University of Porto. His main research field is the use of physical and numerical modeling in the study of offshore, port, and coastal related issues. In the last five years, he developed relevant research on the development of technologies to harness wave energy and on the interaction, interaction between waves and structures. Uh, in the last uh, 15 years, uh, he collaborated in more than uh, 40 R&D projects and consultancy works uh, on coastal port and ocean engineering, coastal management, applied hydraulics and on the development of technology of, for wave energy conversion. As more than 70 scientific publications, international peer review journals and in proceedings of national international conference. Participation in more than uh, 45 training courses, seminars, conferences, and congress, review uh, to seven international index journals, uh, uh, energy, energy conversion management, energies, and was member of the scientific committee uh, of eight conference and congress. Member of the evaluation committee of 28 uh, uh, master of science dissertations and six PhD theses, supervisor and co-supervisor co in of nine, uh, 19 finished master science dissertations and three ongoing PhD theses. Member of the board of the Portuguese Water Resource Association, North uh, Branch, Associate uh, Editor of uh, GICZM, the Journal of Integrated Coastal Zone Management Indexes in Scopus. Uh, in the last uh, eight years, he taught in three international, three integrated master courses uh, at the FEUP, Civil Engineering, Environmental Engineering, and Chemical Engineering a wide range of curricular units. In addition, he also teaches in the, the doctoral program in civil engineering at the FEUP, uh, and was guest professor of the Faculty of Engineering of the Agostinho Neto University in Luanda, Angola, in two master courses. Environment Engineering, 2013 to 2050, uh, and Hydraulics, Water Reserves, Fluvial Hydraulics, Urban Hydraulics and Coastal Engineering uh, to 2014 to 2017. Now you, uh, I'll pass the word to Professor Paulo. Uh, we will have two lectures today in the afternoon and tomorrow in the, the afternoon. Okay? Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the invitation to be here and to take part 
on this uh, course uh, and also to congratulate the organization. Uh, it's not easy to organize such a large course and uh, everything seems perfect. So a lot of work is behind this course. So uh, I think the organization should be congratulated on that. Uh, regarding uh, my participation in this, uh, in this course, it is divided in uh, three in four lectures. Uh, today, uh, I will start by an introduction on marine renewable energies. So the idea is to give you a brief overview of the different resources that you may find in the ocean. Um, so I will not have time to go into the details, but at least I think you can learn what kind of resources you have in the ocean and the potential that is available in the, in the ocean. Later in the afternoon, uh, we, you will have another presentation more focused on tidal energy. I will start by talking about uh, how tides are generated, uh, the resource that is available, um, etc., and also the technologies that are presently available to harness that type of resource. And tomorrow, uh, two lectures that are focused on wave energy. First, about uh, uh, the resource, how waves are generated, how waves are uh, transformed when they propagate from offshore till the shore, etc. And in a second part, I will talk about uh, the, res the technologies that are presently available uh, and uh, uh, the main challenges that uh, we have to harness that uh, kind of, uh, of resource. But before going to the program that you see here, I would like to briefly uh, present you my university. Uh, only, I think, three or four minutes. Um, so I came from the University of Porto, um, in particular from the Faculty of Engineering, uh, that is, of course, in, in Portugal. So you can see here the campus. This is not the campus of the university uh, because in our case uh, the different uh, faculties are spread in the city. So what you are seeing here is the space occupied by the faculty of engineering. So uh, all these buildings are the buildings used to the lectures, namely these ones. Uh, here you have the buildings related to the departments where the teachers, officers are, and also some labs. And we also have uh, in the campus uh, buildings that are occupied by research and development centers that work closely with university. Uh, and let's say they are an interface with uh, uh, the private sector, let's say. Uh, so a picture uh, showing several students very happy to <laughs> study in, in FILP. Um, just some details. So the, the faculty was founded in 1926, but the roots are uh, from 1837. So it's an institution with some history. And the Faculty of Engineering is one of the faculties of the University of, uh, of Porto. Uh, you can see here some pictures about uh, uh, the, the space of the Faculty of Engineering. There we have all these engineering courses, so bioengineering, chemical engineering, civil engineering, well, several courses. I think here you have more or less the same the same courses we have uh, in Porto. Uh, some figures, uh, so we have more than 500 professors, 93% uh, of them have a PhD. In terms of students, if we combine all, we have in the Faculty of Engineering about 8,000. 
Um, in my case, so I, I uh, work in the civil engineering department that is divided in several divisions. Uh, and in my case, I work in the hydraulics, water resources, and environmental division. Uh, and uh, within that uh, division, we have a group that works on marine energy. Uh, and uh, here you can see the members of that, uh, of that group that works uh, in all the topics related with, with marine energy. Here you can see another figure presenting the, the campus. We are based uh, here in this, in this building and our lab is in this, in this part. Okay, so if you go to Portugal, you are invited to visit us and to see uh, the facilities we have in, in Portugal, in particular in Porto. And here, uh, a close view of our wave basin. Uh, here you also have uh, a wave basin. I had the opportunity to visit the basin yesterday. So they are more or less of the same size. Maybe yours is deeper and ours is a little bit uh, longer, but the, the dimensions are uh, in general similar. Okay. Uh, and here you can see the characteristics uh, of our wave generation system. So it's a multi element wave maker uh, with 16 independent paddles, so we can create regular, irregular wave conditions. So we, we, we are able to simulate uh, in our wave basin. Uh, the characteristics of the sea. So we can test the technologies before applying the technologies in the, in the sea. So that's the main uh, use uh, of this kind of, uh, of facilities. And we also have different types of equipment to measure, for instance, the motions of floating bodies, the loads applied in the mooring lines, uh, etc. So we have uh, different kinds of equipments uh, to monitorize the response of the bodies we test in our in our faculty. Okay, so after this introduction, uh, you already know uh, what we have in Porto, so let's go to the topic of this uh, first lecture. And uh, uh, I, I will start by uh, presenting some initial questions uh, that we may answer during this lecture. And uh, the first one is which kind of energy resources we have in the ocean. Do we have an idea which kind of resources we may find uh, in the ocean? Yes. Yes. So waves, tides, wind, so several resources. I will talk more about them later in the next slide. Uh, do you think they are equally important uh, in different parts of the world? No. Perhaps some are more re relevant in some countries than others. So I, I will present some slides that show uh, how the resource uh, uh, of the different uh, resources um, spreads in the, in, the, in the different oceans. Um, um, the other point is, uh, which is the theoretical resource available? Uh, so, uh, how much energy is available, is available on the ocean and how much energy can we harness from the ocean? So, one thing is the theoretical resource, the other thing is the effective resource that we can harness uh, from, the, from the ocean. Uh, Another point is which technologies are presently available uh, to explore those resources. So I will uh, talk briefly about the different technologies that are uh, available. Um, do you know if there are some proofs of concept being carried out in your country? Because uh, we, we are talking about resources that are in a very a early stage of development. So a lot of research is being done in different parts of the world and maybe in your country you 
maybe also have some work being done and some tests in the in the sea. Um, another point that I want to address is how the technologies are developed. So someone has an idea, what, which are the different uh, development stages from that idea to a demonstration on the, on the sea. And uh, a very important point, how expensive the energy is when it is produced using uh, marine resources. It's a very important uh, point and we, we should also talk about this uh, today. So, going to the renewable resources, so we have the waves, of course, you see a lot of waves when you go to the, to the beach, so those waves have energy that can be harnessed. We also have currents that could be related to the tides or not, could be ocean currents. We have the tides, the, up, the, the movement of the water up and down. We have also uh, the, the, the thermal energy of the ocean because the, the, the mass of water in the ocean is at different temperatures in the surface and deep uh, in, the, in the ocean. And the salinity gradients. So in, uh, in, the, in the mouth of the rivers, when the rivers uh, uh, enter the sea, we have salinity gradients that uh, also are a source of, of energy. So these are, let's say, what we call the ocean uh, energy resources. But we can also harness other renewable resources in the ocean. Yes? No, no, it's, it's only the potential available. And uh, those figures may change depending on the source you have. It's, it's not easy to evaluate the amount of energy you have in, in all the, those different types of resources. So those values are only an estimation of the resource available. I will talk more about that later, but you can see that the figures are quite large. So the potential available in the ocean is huge, and we should look at that resource and try to harness at least part of that, of that resource. But uh, besides, um, besides uh, the ocean energy, we can also use uh, the space, the marine space, to harness, for instance, wind energy. So uh, we can install a wind turbine in the sea and explore that resource. And the potential available is also huge, as you can see. But we can also install uh, photovoltaic systems in the ocean. We have a huge space, free space, that can be utilized to install the panels and to harness that energy. It's not so easy as in land, but it's also a possibility. Okay? And we also have the, mar the marine biomass. So it's another resource re related with the ocean. Okay? So this is just to give you an overview of the different type of resources you have in the ocean. Um, so to uh, have a more clear view, so we can put together waves, tides, ocean currents, the salinity gradients and the thermal gradients in this uh, set and we call that uh, ocean energy. If we had to that the offshore wind, marine biomass, and eventually the wind, the, the sun, harness in the, in the sea, we have the marine renewable energies, okay? But we also have these traditional renewable energies, okay? So this uh, talk is focused on this and this.
okay? So the renewable resources that are directly or indirectly related to the, to the, to the sea. Okay, so uh, you know already that the resource available is huge, um, but one important point is, which is the cost of the energy that is produced using those, those resources. And as you imagine, at present, the cost of the energy produced by those resources is higher than the energy that is produced with conventional renewable energy resources. So the question is why to invest money trying to develop those technologies. And one possible reason, a very good one, is that the energy consumption is increasing. Uh, the demand is increasing and we should be able uh, to uh, produce the energy that will be needed in the, in the future. Um, you have here some additional reasons. So the fossil fuels may peak. Um, it's very important to have a, di a diversified energetic uh, mix. Uh, so you, you have here some reasons that justify the research effort that is being done uh, to explore the resources related to the to the ocean here you can see that in more detail what we can see here is that first the world population is increasing very fast you have here some some figures so the energy consumption increases with the increase of population but another important point is that not only the population is increasing, but also the consumption per capita. So we, if you combine both, you see that the energy needed uh, is increasing also very, very fast. So we need to rely not only in the traditional uh, sources of energy, but also to look to the more recent uh, resources and so to look to the marine renewable resources. So they may be expensive at present, since we are, let's say, starting the learning curve, but maybe in a few years from now, they could have a competitive cost. So we need to invest now to have the return some uh, years from now. Uh, for instance, you can see here the huge increase of the energy uh, demand, the shale gas may help, uh, but maybe it's not, it's not enough. So we, we should look to other resources and uh, try to, to compensate with the energy that, is, uh, that, that comes from those resources. Uh, in addition, uh, by using renewable energies, as you know, we are reducing the emissions of, green, uh, of greenhouse gases. So that is, is good for, for the planet. And we are also improving the uh, environment. So it's, it's good to, to have renewables uh, here. And uh, as you easily understand, it is irresponsible presently not to implement changes uh, to mitigate uh, what is now a reality that is the, the, climate, the climate change. So some uh, figures now. If we combine uh, the theoretical resource of all those marine resources, so the contribution from waves, from tides, etc., all together we reach this figure. So in a, in a here, we, are, we have all this amount of energy. You can compare this figure with this one that corresponds to the electricity consumption. And you can see that 
the theoretical potential is much higher than the world electricity, electricity consumption. Okay? Of course, you cannot harness all this energy because the technologies have efficiencies, and efficiency is not 100%, nor close to that value. We, can also inst we cannot install the technologies everywhere, so there are some places that cannot be used. So, but if, even taking into account that, I think in the future we can supply or we can contribute to a large extent to the electricity consumption in the, in the world. Here you have the primary energy supply, so it's a figure very close to, to that one. And if you notice, here I am not taking into account the offshore wind, neither the biomass or the energy uh, harness in the sea coming from the sun. Okay? So, the use of marine energy can be justified to mitigate climate change effects, of course, to reduce environmental pollution is uh, also a very good reason, to improve uh, the security in energy supply so the countries can produce their own energy and not being dependent on other countries. For instance, in Portugal, we don't have natural gas or oil, so we have to import those uh, uh, energy resources. So it's good to have energy, renewable energy produced it in, the, in the country. Uh, it also helps to develop the sea economy, so a very important uh, uh, sector. And it could also help us dealing with the variability of the costs of the fossil fuels in the international markets. Okay, so uh, a very good number of reasons to uh, invest and to explore the marine renewable resources. Of course, we have uh, a lot of energy good energy, but that energy can also be very destructive. So, and the technologies that are on the sea should be able to, with, to withstand those very high loadings. You can see here the impact of this wave here and the amount of splash. So imagine technology that has to be uh, in the ocean for 15, 20, 25 years to survive several winters, so it's not easy. So a huge potential, but also huge challenges to transform that destructive energy in something clean and profitable. Okay, so it's a very important challenge. In terms of resource, I will present now uh, some uh, information, some details, and some figures about uh, the resource and uh, how it is spread in the, in the ocean. Starting uh, with, uh, with the wave energy, you can see here the wall distribution of the annual mean power density. The figures are in kilowatts per meter of uh, front, of wave front, okay? And these figures are an annual mean. So you can see that different parts of the world have different uh, types of resource. For instance, uh, here around Portugal, we have in medium terms about 40, 40 kilowatts per meter of wave front. Uh, there are some regions here nearby Australia with a huge resource. In Brazil, well, you have not much, but a reasonable value. Okay, so different parts of the world have different uh, resource levels. 
So looking more close to Portugal, so Portugal is this country here uh, that uh, is nearby Spain. So this is Spain and here is Portugal. So this is a very easy formula to estimate the wave power. We only need to put here the seawater density. Uh, you, you, sh you should know uh, this figure. Here we have the gravity acceleration. Here we have the wave height, so the difference between the trough and the crest of the wave. Here, the wave period, so is the time interval between two successive crests. And using this expression, we can estimate the power in a, in a wave. Uh, and the values will be in watts per meter of wave front. Okay? In our case, since we are exposed to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, if we make that calculation, we get a value, a mean value for all the year of about four kilowatts per meter of wave front. What do you think? Is it a small figure or a large figure? Large. Yeah. And if you have any doubts on that, we can say that if you pick all the power in a wave front with two meters, you have the same power of a normal car. Uh, 80 kilowatts, more or less, 108 uh, CV. So, and I'm talking about mean values, okay? Not uh, the peak values in the winter, okay? For instance, in Portugal, uh, in the summer, we may have waves of one meter or even less than that, but during the winter, we may have waves of 12 meters or more. So 12 meters is a building with four floors. So it's a, it's a very large wave. And in Brazil, what do you think about Brazil? Perhaps the, the, the waves are smaller. I think the sea is more calm here. But on the other side, as far as I know, you have not 750 kilometers, but 10 times that. So uh, the coastline is very, is very large. So I think as homework, let's say, you could try to see in your country Let's say what is the mean wave and the dimension of the coast. Just to have an idea of the potential you have in your country uh, on, on, on waves, okay? So it's, I think it's something easy that you can do very quickly if you use the, the, in the Google, okay? Here you have also some figures, so the average values of wave power for different parts of the world. In front of Portugal, about 40 kilowatts per meter of wave front. If we go north, nearby Ireland and Scotland, we have almost twice that value. If you go to the south, we have, we, we have a small resource and here in front of Brazil, maybe something around 20 kilowatts per meter of wave front. Some, some uh, values per continent. So the figure for North America, uh, Australia, South America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. So the potential available. So if we combine all the resource around the borders of the different continents. And here the figures for the North Hemisphere and for the South Hemisphere. So it's a huge amount of, of energy. And here the theoretical resource available. So this figure can change. It depends 
on the way it is uh, evaluated, but, uh, well, even if we choose this, this figure, it's a, a huge amount of energy that is available. Here you can have a more clear perspective uh, on Europe. So Portugal has, let's say, a medium resource. It's high, but it's not so high as in this part of Europe, so in Ireland and Scotland. Okay, but there are, you know, in Europe, some areas with a very low wave energy resource. The Mediterranean is not a good place, in principle, uh, for this resource. Although there are some projects being developed for that uh, part uh, of Europe. It's, sometimes it depends on the technology uh, that is uh, used. In terms of technology, what we can see right now is that, uh, unlike uh, what happens in the wind uh, turbines sector, at least in what relates to the onshore installations, where we have, let's say, some standard solutions. So uh, if you are not an expert, all these turbines seem quite similar. Uh, but in the case of wave energy, we have a wide variety of technologies. You have here only a few. Tomorrow I'll present more. But each one is different from the other. So instead of standard technologies, we have a very wide variety of technologies. There are more than 1,000 patents of devices to our nest wave energy and more than 100 concepts being developed. So just to give you an idea of the variety of concepts that are presently uh, available and being developed. Okay, I don't know if I jump. Okay. Okay. Another resource that we may found in the ocean is the ocean thermal energy. Okay. Uh, so it's is related with the temperature in the in the ocean. And. Uh, this figure, what presents is the difference of temperature between the surface waters and uh, the waters that are uh, one kilometer below the surface. And um, we can see that uh, the locations where the difference is higher are around here, okay? Where the, the water at the surface is higher because in the, in the deeps of the ocean, the, the water temperature is more or less the same uh, in the different parts of the of the world, so this this type of uh, technologies take advantage of the temperature difference between uh, the surface and the uh, uh, water nearby the the bottom, and uh, that difference should be uh, at least 20 degrees. Uh, so we can see here that the most interesting locations to our nest is resource are these locations here, so the locations where you see the yellow and orange or red color. Okay, so it's not a good resource to be harnessed in Europe, at least uh, in this part of Europe, but it could be a, a good option for other countries in the, in the world, although it's, it's a domain that is also in a very er early stage of development. Okay. So the, the best locations are usually located in the, in the tropics where the ocean surface water is around 27 to 29 degrees. Uh, the potential associated to this source of energy is very, is very high. You can see here 44,000 uh, megawatts hour per year. So a huge, a huge resource, but it's not a good resource for Europe. As you can see here, only some overseas territories have uh, an interesting uh, resource. 
well, the technologies available uh, can be grouped in these three types. The closed cycle here, usually ammonia is used in the process. And the open cycle system uh, where water is used. And there are also some technologies that combine both. Another resource is the salinity gradient. So we have here uh, a river mouth. Here we have the sea. So fresh water, salt water. So there is a difference in the concentration of salt. And uh, that difference of uh, concentration can uh, be transformed in a source of, of energy. So the salinity of water is around this figure here, the seawater around that, so we can explore that, uh, that difference. Here you can see a figure that shows how the salinity varies in the ocean. So uh, there are some parts of the ocean with a higher concentration of salt than others. And you can see here some uh, potential, not only for the world, but also for, for Europe. So these technologies explore the salinity gradients uh, and make use the differences in terms of osmotic pressure between the, the, the waters with the different salt uh, content. In terms of technologies, we have the pressure retarded osmosis. So as you may know, if we have fresh water and salt water, water tends to cross this membrane and go from here to there. Okay? So this results in a pressure increase, and that energy can be converted into electricity uh, by a, a proper a proper system. Uh, it is also possible to take uh, advantage of the chemical potential between both solutions. Uh, so in this case, let's say is 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 a chemical way of harness that kind of uh, of energetic uh, resource. The drawback of uh, this. Uh, technologies uh, that both rely on specific membranes that are very expensive and the efficiencies are not so good as we would, l would like them to be. So it's a, it's a, a critical point of this, of this system. Um, so the main barriers to development, let's say, are of course the membranes that are required in both systems and uh, their performance uh, that is not higher, is, is not high uh, at, this, at this moment. Um, in addition, um, nearby the power station, we are discharging uh, water with a high uh, salt uh, contain in a, in a water with, with a lower salt contain, so we could have some impact there. It's not a big impact, but it could be uh, uh, mentioned as, a, as an impact. But there are some research being done in UK, Norway, and the United States, uh, and research uh, started more or less in the 70s, as far as I know. Um, as I mentioned initially, we can also harness wind at sea. If you uh, have a flight uh, uh, that crosses the North Sea, and if there are no clouds in the sky, and you look below, you can see some offshore parks already installed in the North Sea with, uh, several, hundreds, with several hundreds of, of wind turbines. Um, like in this, in this case here. Um, in fact, the, the resource 
available uh, in the North Sea is is high in terms of of wind uh, of wind energy. So you, you you can see here that the red and blue color are associated to high wind speeds. So we have a, a good wind potential there. And in, the, and in addition, the water depths, at least in some parts of the North Sea, are not too high. So it is possible to use uh, piles uh, that are uh, fixed in the sea bottom to support the wind turbine. And so they, we have already some commercial uh, wind parks in the, in the North Sea in operation. Uh, so the main challenge now is to develop suitable and cost-effective solutions to harness wind energy in deep waters, because in deep waters is not uh, a good idea to install a very large pile, because it will be very costly, and that will have an impact in the cost of the energy that will, is produced that way. Here you can have um, uh, uh, a world perspective, uh, so, what you have here is the is the, the wind speed at the height of 10 meters. So, there is the North Sea, where most of the parks are. Uh, Portugal, Brazil. So, well, the resource is not uh, extremely high, but is high enough to justify the development of technologies for that kind of applications. Here you have the locations of the parks that are already in operation, under construction and proposed. So most of them are here in the North Sea, a few here in the United States and also in this part of Asia. Okay. So there are already a, num uh, a number of large-scale projects uh, nowadays uh, running, especially uh, nearby UK and in the, in the North Sea. And the motivation for that, because it is more expensive to install a wind turbine in the sea than in land, is that in the sea, open sea, we have more stable and more strong winds, okay? And so that's the, the main motivation to, to go to the, to the sea. In addition, there are also some uh, limitations in terms of the size of the turbines that we can install in land that we do not have in sea, because it's easier to transport uh, the turbine in a boat than in a truck to install the turbine in, in the top of a mountain. So there are some constraints that we do not have in the, in the sea uh, that justify uh, all these investments uh, to install wind turbines in the, in the sea. Um, however, uh, the sea also presents uh, some uh, new challenges. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's more difficult to install uh, the turbines in the sea and to ensure they are operating well uh, during their lifetime. Uh, the maintenance operations are more difficult to perform in the sea than inland. So there are additional technological needs and challenges uh, for this kind of uh, applications. Uh, well, it's also worth mentioning that uh, most of the technologies uh, being used in this kind uh, of parks came from the, the oil and gas industry and from the traditional wind power industry. So we, we are combining uh, knowledge that comes from two very different uh, sectors. Uh, well, to, to have an idea uh, of the trends, I have here this, this graphic that shows uh, how the installed capacity changed from 1993 till 2015. And so you can see that the increase 
in installed capacity was very quick from the beginning till here a very huge increase in terms of installed capacity and this trend should continue in the future so 2015 2030 and you see that the trend is expected to continue in the future so a lot in, of investment in this area and of course the cost of the energy tends to reduce as the scale of the sector increases what is good we can also see here uh, in this uh, figure uh, information about uh, the distance to the shore and the information in terms of uh, water depths in the locations where the parks are installed. So what we can see is that most of the parks are nearby the coast. So in that case, we need a shorter submarine cable to transport the energy to the shore. And in addition, usually we have smaller water depths. So it is easier to install the supporting pile uh, there but uh, uh, in spite of that we also have some uh, projects foreseen and uh, already installed uh, far away from shore in this case about 70 miles and in very deep waters about 90 meters and in this case a demonstration plant in Portugal in a water depth of about 50 meters okay so in Portugal uh, we have very high water depths nearby the coast so typically the solutions that are used in the North Sea are not suitable for our coast so uh, what is done is to uh, try to develop floating solutions to give support to the to the wind turbines so this uh, is a demonstration project that uh, run between 2011 till 2016 uh, two megawatts uh, turbine floating turbine and uh, uh, here we have uh, another another project if i'm not wrong maybe nearby norway uh, so the harvestable energy available is very high uh, you have here some figures, uh, some estimations for 2020 and 2030. Uh, and here you can see the different uh, technologies available to support wind turbines. So nearby the coast, the most usual solution is to install a pile, what we call a monopile, a single pile to support the turbine. For larger water depths, maybe better to install a tripod or a jacket structure like this one. In deep waters, the tension leg platform or the Smith submersible platform. And for very high water depths, the spar boy. So depending on the water depths, we have different uh, supporting structures. Uh, so initially, all the parks were based on these kind of solutions. A lot of research is being done uh, regarding demonstration in the sea of these kind of solutions because they are the only ones available uh, for deep water locations. Um, that is clear here. Uh, in, this, in this figure, you have here the water depth and here the cost and here uh, the price, how the price changes with the with water depth. So you can see that the, the monopile after, uh, let's say, 25, 30 meters uh, is not more uh, cost competitive with uh, this kind of, of solutions and after 50 60 meters 
only the, the floating structures are cost competitive. Now, uh, some overview of the most uh, well-known uh, technologies. We have here the Sparboy system, a tension leg platform system, and uh, a Smith submersible uh, system. So I'll start by the, the wind float. Uh, this, uh, this concept um, is being developed by a, a consortium where ADP, the Portuguese uh, electricity company, is, is a, a major uh, partner and uh, was developed and installed uh, offshore the Portuguese coast. You can see here some uh, pictures uh, showing the transportation and installation of the floating platform. And uh, this kind of technology is, is suitable for water depths higher than 40 meters. So it cannot be applied uh, at smaller water depths. Um, is a very uh, is is a, a solution that is very easy to transport. So all this is uh, stable. Uh, you can use a tug to push uh, the turbine uh, to the place and then to move uh, that to the sea bottom. Uh, usually. This is uh, in s the, di the different parts are assembled in a, in a shipyard. So uh, you, you can put all the parts together in land and then to transport uh, uh, the turbine with the supporting structure to the, to the sea. Um, these kind of solutions may have larger movements than a tension leg platform that I will present next. Um, and also, uh, they are more heavy. So we, you, you need to use more steel to build this kind of solutions. So that's one drawback. But they are more stable and able to support higher waves than the other ones. Yeah. Uh, uh, I will, no, uh, I will present a, a video in uh, about two slides that shows all the process from the uh, construction in the shipyard till the installation and mooring uh, in the sea and also how the ballast in these uh, piles is adjusted to compensate uh, the load distribution in the, in the structure. Uh, a potential drawback is that uh, the footprint of the solution is larger than in the other cases because uh, we need uh, some mooring lines and we occupy some areas in the some area in the in the sea bottom. Some challenges to control movements and accelerations and uh, let's say to avoid uh, some resonance effects with, uh, with waves and of course to reduce the, the weight and cost of the structure. Uh, the initial structures were designed following more or less the codes that are used in the oil and gas industry, so very conservative designs and so perhaps the future installations will have a different uh, design, uh, a less expensive design, because uh, the risks here are not so large as in the oil and gas uh, sector. So here you have a, a video that presents all the process from the installation in the shipyard or inside the port till the installation in the sea. So you can see the different parts being put together. It, it's easier to, to build this on land than in the sea. Hmm? Where 
where is the sorry ah, in this case was in portugal uh Stubal. south part but, but in that case was only for uh one uh, because w was the wind float demonstration project uh, this is is a video that uh, intends to present uh, all the process but is not a, a real video is an animation to to show how the process is is done so we, here you have a, a park with uh, several turbines and the tugboat pushing the new one you have some some boys here they are connected to, to that they are associated to the mooring system if we put some water inside these parts we have the seeking of the structure and yeah the the, the ballast to control the position of the platform especially because the wind may change direction and it's important to maintain the turbine working properly. These plates are to reduce the eave motion. And you can see the mooring cables and also the electrical cables that transport the energy to a substation and then to the, to the shore. So the, the demonstration project uh, run very well, and so uh, very shortly uh, a new uh, installation will be done in Portugal, uh, nearby Vena do Castelo. Uh, this time not a single uh, element, but a small park with three or four uh, wind floats. The other option is the tension leg platform. So it's a different concept. It's a lighter concept, as you can see here. Uh, but the price to pay is that, in this case, the construction and the installation are more difficult and more costly. So you save in steel cost, but you have more difficult and complex operations uh, in, the, in the sea is a solution that is suitable for water depths about above 50 meters. Um, the movements are not large, but uh, it requires a complex and expensive mooring system. And we need some redundancy because this solution is not stable without the tensioned mooring system. So. Uh, we need some redundancy to ensure that the structure is, is stable. Uh, on the other side, uh, the space occupied is smaller. So the, the, the footprint in the bottom is much smaller than in the case of the, uh, the wind float. Challenges, well, to develop simple and, de and less expensive mooring systems, uh, to one question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, my name is Ulysses. I'm I'm from Brazil, and uh, I know that the offshore wind is an alternative to to energy. But uh, in Brazil, the the cost of the special cable is very high, and uh, in the offshore wind, how much the percentual cost of the 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 cost of the installation represent the the cost of the cable in the installation and uh, if we, for the value justify the installation in offshore and not yeah. in 
onshore? Well, it's, it's a good question. Uh, I, I don't have a, a specific number for that. Um, and uh, that cost also depends on the local conditions. Uh, so they, the costs may change from one location to the other. Uh, but the, the main motivation to invest uh, in this kind of projects uh, is that uh, uh, in the sea, typically we have more strong and stable winds. And uh, we can also install in the sea large uh, turbines because uh, the installations in land are somehow limited uh, by the trucks that transport uh, the different parts of the turbines to the top of the mountain for the installation. In the sea, you don't have that type of, uh, of constraints. You can uh, build the components in a factory nearby the port to put those, compo those components in the boat and to transport that to the installation site. Uh, so uh, the, the dimension of the wind turbines in the sea is increasing uh, very fast uh, in order to reduce the, the cost of the, of the energy. Um, at present, uh, I, I will present later some figures, uh, this energy is not, uh, um, well, it's, it's, it's a little bit more expensive than the energy produced onshore uh, at the moment, but the, but the prices are, are going down. And uh, very shortly, possibly, they, they will be very similar. And the other reason is that uh, in some countries, um, the good places for the installation of wind parks in land uh, do not exist anymore. If you go to Portugal, we have uh, several wind parks in our mountains. So it's difficult right now to see one mountain without uh, the wind turbines. And so if we install the turbines in the sea, you don't have that visual impact. Okay, so there are several reasons that justify this kind of, uh, of investments. Uh, of course, we have some extra costs, and the cost of the cable, of course, is a very important part, but we also have some advantages, and uh, if you put all that together, you may have a benefit. And, uh, well, uh, presently, uh, these projects uh, are being uh, developed by the private sector, and uh, they only invest if they feel that they are going to have a return. And, uh, and if, if you see the increase of the installed capacity on sea, so they, they see a lot of potential on that. Okay. Well, you <laughs> well that's, a, that's a difficult question. Um, well, uh, well, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> 10 miles, 15 miles. Um, but um, there are also other constraints. Uh, so there are some areas nearby the coast that are uh, protected uh, because, they, because of uh, biodiversity reasons. Uh, there are also navigation routes. Uh, so we cannot install wind parks where we want. So there are some uh, areas uh, available, but not all the, all the space. Uh, but uh, these projects should have a, a, a study, an environmental study and uh, an impact study to uh, analyze all the details uh, before they are implemented. Okay. Yeah, I have just a question about the submarine cable. Um, are we limited with the size of a submarine cable? For example, if we have a lot of power or a lot of currents, can we have any size with the submarine cable or are we limited? Yeah, well, the, 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 the submarine cable should be protected. Uh, so, um, for instance, a, 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 very cal, a, a very critical part is the part of the cable nearby the braking zone where the waves break because uh, in that location, uh, when the waves break, uh, you have uh, a lot of sediment movement, 
and so the C bottom is unstable. It can change a lot. So it's better to bury the cable there to protect the, see, the cable. Um, and uh, that may also be valid uh, in deeper waters because of the, the action of currents. But uh, in this case, each case is a different case. So it's, uh, it's, it's necessary first to make some studies, to analyze the currents on site, to analyze the, the waves, so to uh, analyze all the details before uh, design uh, the protection for the cable. Okay, because we want the cable to be stable and, uh, and uh, not having any problems in the future on that. But the, the actions on the cable depend a lot on the local environmental conditions uh, on, on, on site. And the critical part is uh, in the braking zone, so where the sea bottom is very uh, variable, where morphological changes are very significant. Any, any more uh, questions? Yes? Erika from Brazil. Uh, tell us more about the maintenance. How is the interaction with the uh, marine life, uh, the animals? Uh, how, yeah. how is the frequency to clean yeah. the structure? <laughs> It's a, it's, a it's a very good question, and uh, I have some slides <laughs> in the end of the presentation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have some slides uh, that uh, address that topic. So the marine growth, uh, and also the maintenance operations that are, of course, more difficult uh, in offshore than in, in the shore. But I will talk more about that uh, later in this in this presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, so m moving to to the to the other concept, so the the spar boy. Uh, so in this case, we have let's say a floating pile. So something like this with a turbine on top. So it uh, it, it does not seem very stable, but in fact is a solution to uh, support the, the, the wind turbine. This kind uh, of solutions is suitable for water depths uh, between uh, or, or above 120 or 150 meters, so large water depths. Um, well, it's very important to control the roll and pitch movements, so we should control the amount of movements the, the support has. Um, one critical point uh, of this uh, concept is the installation. So it's much more difficult to install this um, in the sea than, for instance, the semi-submersible type of structure. Um, so some challenges are to control the movements, to control the movements of uh, the, the turbine, uh, to reduce fatigue, and to develop suitable, less costly and complex transport and installation techniques. Uh, I will present also a video uh, to show you how complex uh, the installation of these uh, turbines is. So you can compare the difficulty of this uh, installation with the case you have seen before about the, the wind float. So you can see here a picture, so you can see the spar boy, so a very thin pile. It seems more thin than actually it is, so you can have piles with uh, a diameter of eight, nine, or even more meters, but they are very high. Uh, maybe 60, 70, or 80 meters. And to maintain this in place, we need some mooring lines for station keeping, and we need to put a lot of ballast here for stability reasons. So the only way to maintain this pile vertically in the ocean is to reduce 
the center of mass uh, and that is ensured by installing a lot of ballast here. A picture showing the installation and now a video that uh, shows all the process. So it's a similar video but in this case for the spar boy. This uh, concept is being developed by a company from Norway, uh, from Stat Oil. So that uh, is, is an oil company that has a division uh, that uh, uh, is focused on the new energies, let's say. So maybe they are preparing uh, for the future, I don't know. So you can see the transportation of the different parts of the turbine, but uh, the, the assemblage of that parts has to be done in the, in the sea. And very specialized boats are required for the installation. You see, instead of only one, one, two, one tugboat, you have there three. So more, a more complex procedure. And here, another, another boat. So this installation takes more time and more people also. some ballast to increase the draft of the spar boy then it is pushed to that supporting boat so you, you can see the length of the part that is below water so several meters below water now some solid ballast for instance concrete being place it inside so it's very important to put a lot of ballast in the bottom videos have some sound but in this case it's not possible to, to hear that so now some components for the upper structure that should be put together also in C so the C should be very quiet otherwise it is very difficult to fix all the components together. So it's, it, it's a more complex uh, installation. Yeah, it's metallic, usually steel.
can see that a lot of operations should be carried out with a very high precision. And so it takes more, more time. Specialized vessels are needed. So, uh, ships uh, specialized to transport all these components to the sea and to put all of those components together. large part of the structure is below water. Okay, so I think the most important parts were already shown. Okay. So, in terms of uh, water depths and uh, wave conditions. Uh, for the rougher wave conditions, uh, the best solution is the SME submersible platform. Uh, so this uh, structure uh, was installed uh, five years uh, offshore the Portuguese coast and was able to s successfully withstand uh, five winters with with very high waves so it's a good solution for that kind of applications um, and for water depths above uh, 40 meters uh, if you have larger water depths and uh, waves not too high you may decide to adopt the spar boy system and the tension lag platform is more or less in between the two the two solutions. Um, here you, you can see um, some uh, comparison between uh, the three the three concepts and the developing uh, stages. So you can see here. I think we cannot read properly here, but. Uh, well, th this is mostly related with uh, the development stages and the uh, demonstration in the, in the sea. And uh, we can see here that uh, the most uh, developed ones are the spar boy solution and the SME submersible uh, solution. Because if I'm not wrong, this color here represents the, intel the demonstration in the, in the sea, but I cannot read properly from, from here. Um, so I, I presented uh, three different uh, solutions, uh, but uh, uh, there are other uh, technologies being developed. Uh, so you can see here uh, other uh, concepts being developed in those three categories of supporting structures but uh, the most developed ones are the wind float, a consortium between a Portuguese company and an uh, American company, and the high wind technology of the spar boy type being developed in, in Norway. So uh, you can see here 
the different developing stages, so the concept development, scale testing, full-scale prototype, and the pre-commercial stage. So it's where these two technologies already are. So they are not uh, in the commercial phase, but very close to, to that. And there are other options uh, approaching also that, uh, that phase. Um, this slide here is to show you that uh, besides the typical turbine, there are also some other solutions being idealized and tested. Uh, we have here this concept. So instead of a uh, horizontal axis of rotation, we have a vertical one. Okay. The advantage of this uh, option is that uh, uh, let's say the core part of the turbine is at a lower uh, elevation, so it's more easier to make the uh, maintenance of the, of the technology. So uh, you can compare the dimension of the boat that is required to give support to those operations. In this case, the boat is much larger than uh, in that case. Another advantage is that in this case, if the wind changes direction, the turbine also needs to change the direction to produce effectively uh, energy. In this case, uh, there is no difference. So since the uh, rotation is along a vertical axis. So this is the typical solution, but other solutions are being idealized and tested. And perhaps in the future, we could we, we we may find this kind of installations in the in the sea. Well, uh, here you can see the evolution in terms of uh, dimensions. Uh, not only uh, the dimensions of the turbine rotor, but also the increase in terms of the rated power of the turbines. So now we already have turbines above five megawatts, but uh, much higher figures are expected in the, in the near future. And uh, installations in the sea have less constraints uh, since it's more easy to install big uh, components in the sea than inland, especially due to the transportation uh, in highways and uh, uh, to put everything uh, in, the, in the mountain. Uh, some challenges also uh, related with the, the materials suitable for such large uh, uh, turbines. Um, a new project uh, that is also being developed by a consortium that includes a Portuguese company is the Demo Gravi project. Uh, in this case, the idea is to develop a new supporting structure for turbines for water depths above the usual application water depths of the monopiles. It is based on a, a, a gravity uh, solution. In this case, we have uh, three uh, uh, supports, uh, concrete supports. The structure is being idealized to float by itself in order to be transported to the installation site this way, so uh, with the assistance of the tugboat, and then, and then with, the, with help of some ballast, the turbine can go, can go down and uh, be installed in, in place. So the idea is to have, let's say, uh, an alternative to the submersible platforms for water depths of around 50 meters or a little bit above or below that, uh, that figure. Uh, well, some uh, information about, about the levelized cost of energy. Uh, well, here the idea is to, is to show uh, how that parameter, economical parameter, varied uh, along the time. Uh, you can see that early in the 80s, the onshore wind was uh, an expensive uh, uh, energy resource. 
but now it's cost competitive with the traditional sources because there was a lot of research, a lot of improvements, and uh, that made possible to come from this point to, to this point, okay? Uh, in the offshore wind, we started later in Denmark with some offshore parks very close to the coast. Now we are moving to larger water depths. But uh, maybe in the future we can also get a cost competitive uh, price uh, with traditional energy sources. Uh, so before the break, I will talk uh, briefly about uh, this economical parameter because we are usually talking about the cost of the energy, the cost of the electricity, and I think it's important for you to have an idea uh, how this parameter is uh, calculated. Uh, so the LCOE um, is, let's say, a standard in this, uh, in this sector uh, to define the cost of the electricity, and it is uh, calculated uh, considering uh, all the costs uh, in the life cycle of the, of the installation and considering also all the energy that is produced uh, in, that, uh, in that period. So, for instance, if you are talking about a technology to be installed in the sea, we should take into account not only the capital costs related to the construction of the device, uh, to the foundation in the sea, uh, to the moorings, connections, uh, uh, the design is also a cost that should be taken into account, the, the commissioning, but also the operational costs to maintain the farm operating in the sea, maintenance, operation, insurance, eventually seabed renting and transmission charges. And we also take into account the energy that is produced. Okay, so uh, is a very good uh, metric to assess the real cost of the energy that is produced. And we can also take into account inflation in the analysis and, uh, and discounted uh, to, uh, and, and to account for the time value of the, of the money. You can see here the, the equation. So in the upper part, the sum of the costs over the lifetime of the, of the installation. So we put there everything. So the, in, the initial investment costs, the operation and maintenance costs, uh, fuel in some cases. In the case of the renewables, we don't have fuel costs. That's one of the advantages. Uh, and in this part here, uh, we uh, should uh, uh, put the electricity that is produced um, over the lifetime of the, of the installation. And the result is the levelized cost of the energy or the electricity. Here we can see how that uh, parameter varies for different uh, types of renewables. Uh, in this case, we should take uh, a, a more detailed look on the onshore wind, 50 to 70 euros per megawatt. The offshore wind, that is uh, higher. And the waves that are in an earlier development stage with costs uh, much higher than the uh, offshore wind and the, the onshore wind, okay? But uh, maybe in five or 10 years, this figure will be different uh, because uh, the research development usually leads to a reduction of the costs and to more uh, and to smaller uh, levelized costs of, uh, of energy. Uh, so the, the LCOE can also be regarded as the minimum cost 
at uh, which energy should be sold to break even over the lifetime of the project. So it's, it's a good reference uh, for, uh, for this kind of uh, analysis. In this case, uh, we have a similar representation, but uh, here what we can see is the division taking into account the different components. So we, ha we, we have the fuel, in cases we need to take into account that. For instance, in these cases, we have some fuel costs. Here, we don't have because they are renewables. And also, the fixed operation and maintenance, the variable operation and maintenance, the commissioning. So all the, the parts are uh, represented here. And you can see that, in general, offshore energies present a higher LCOE than uh, solar, onshore, or other uh, sources of energy. Two thousand and uh, fifteen. 15. Uh, I think, yeah, in this case, yeah, it's two thousand and fifteen. So, but, but uh, well, it, it, it's usual to to have different values depending depending on the source. So I think the most important here is to have an idea of the relative uh, values. And uh, what you should retain here is that uh, marine renewable energies in general are more expensive than the other renewables. But this is the present situation, so maybe in the future this will change and uh, maybe we could have uh, a cost competitive uh, uh, energy. Another uh, graphic. Uh, you, you can see these in more detail after because the presentations will be given to you later. Here you, ca you can see uh, another estimation uh, of the LCOE and how it varied along uh, a long time with the increase of the dimensions of the, of the turbines. Here you can see uh, from another source other other values not only the present values but also the expected values uh, in the in the future uh, but as I said before these values change a lot uh, depending on the source you you are considering okay uh, so there are learning curves for each resource Professor, and this technology. May I have a question? Um, you are showing us uh, what you think it's uh, like a trend to decrease the value of the, this kind of solution. Um, from our past lectures, for example, in the PV system, what made uh, it cost decrease was uh, China tried to manufacture almost everything in that. When you show it to us, the main manufacturers, I didn't see anyone from China. I see from a lot of countries. Okay, but uh, do you expect that uh, the the lower, the, the decreasing the cost, um, how you, do you expect that it happens by a lot of people, a lot of countries manufacture, or like a China to, to, to decide to make everything good? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh, in, in this kind of uh, technologies, uh, the, the steel uh, is perhaps one of the main components and uh, it has a, a price in the international markets. Uh, and so possibly the cost reduction is somehow limited by that, uh, by that price. But uh, maybe in the future, new materials could be used uh, with similar or even improved properties. And so that, that, that uh, could re result in a reduction of the, of the cost. Uh, well, it's, it's very difficult to predict uh, what is going to happen in the future. Uh, but uh, once more research is done, more experience is obtained for, from the see installations and uh, as far as we increase the number of installations there is a, a scale uh, effect so uh, what I can say is that we should expect a reduction 
uh, in the future. Uh, of course, if China uh, decides to invest uh, in a very strong way in this sector, of course, and the prices will go down faster than the other way. But uh, it's very difficult to predict what is going to happen in the, in the future. Uh, well, here we have again uh, the, re the reduction of the LCOE for the onshore uh, wind. Uh, so a very large reduction. And here the cost of the solar photovoltaics also a very, a very large reduction. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Brun from Angola. Uh, 